Well, that's a big that's a big thing that Apple does right, which is they integrate you into a system that's fully closed. And unlike you know, I've, I'm a big fan of PCs and Android, but I've been using a Mac for the last couple of years, begrudgingly at first, absolutely. <laughs> but now I'm like, you know connectivity i can just put my uh, airpods in and it will immediately switch from my phone to my computer and back and like these are these small things that like once mm. you kind of taste them it's hard to go back attention all citizens of the future buckle up and step into our time tunnel of imagination to join us on an extraordinary journey into the days of futures past Remember those flying cars and space rockets, the robot maids and cities on Mars that dazzled your childhood dreams of life beyond? This, my friends, is where our adventure begins. So let's go to our guide, that excavator of the eventual, that historian of the hereafter, that recorder of retro futures, Theo Priestley. Hello again and welcome to another episode of Days of Futures Past where I talk about science fiction retro futures with a guest of mine. Today I have Damir first on the line. Hi Damir, how are you? Hi, it's a pleasure to be here at the end to see you again after last summer. Yeah, for a bit of context, uh, Damir and I met in uh, Split X, uh, an event, rather a, a really good actually intimate event uh, run in Croatia in Split, in the city of Split. Um, we're a gathering of, I would say, some of the brightest minds in tech um, come together um, for um, a couple of days. Um, very intimate in terms of small groups. Um, everyone knows each other. Everyone's quite happy to challenge each other on their points of view as well. It's not so much having keynotes it's as more of uh, roundtable discussions and powwows. Um, and uh, you take away a lot from that from that event. And of course, the host... Um, is absolutely fantastic, treated like kings and queens there. Um, but that's where Damir and I first met. Um, what, are you, what have you been up to since? Yeah, somehow I also ended up in that event. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it was wonderful. Yeah, it was quite nice. So, yeah, I'm, uh, right now I'm doing some uh, research about a project that I want to do in the future. It has to do with uh, both Dungeons and & Dragons and spatial computing. So both roleplay and D&D, which is a massive passion of mine, has been since I was a child, since I read Tolkien for the first time when I was 12. And then spatial computing, which is something that I got into a few years back, um, something I've been researching since around 2019. And that got into it in 2021. So um, as you can see, uh, I don't know when this is going to air, but the last couple of days have been quite interesting because spatial computing has been all over the internet mm. as a new term, which uh, I boldly claimed in 2021 that is going to be the buzzword of 2024 or, or 2025. And I think we're going to see the peak hype around spatial computing this year, probably. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you've seen, um, and again, this will probably date this podcast, but you know, it's been CES um, this week, and um, and and lots of new um, glasses have been announced. Apple Vision Pro, have, of course, announced when you can now buy um, their their units at was it three and a half thousand dollars a piece. That's going to mm -hmm. be quite interesting to see how how widely receptive that is. Um, but like you say, yes, yeah, spatial computing we've kind of moved away from. XR, mixed reality, virtual reality, augmented reality, and and I think even Apple themselves, in terms of marketing and and how the Apple stores treat it, um, have been given a moratorium against using any of the previous terms because they want to cement spatial computing as the term going forward. Yeah, it's uh, it's a very interesting moment because. Uh... As computing has moved from from the PC, from the desktop into mobile, I feel like the next is, step in that journey of tech is going to be spatial computing. And I think it's more than just a buzzword in terms of what it actually means for how humans interact with technology. And I think it's really cool that they're pushing this narrative because in the end, the narrative is what's going to be convincing the people to use something or not. Well, the form factor 
of the product itself, but also a sense of familiarity with it. So my speaking suspicion, my seeking suspicion is that the reason why spatial computers are now going to be something that we wear on our face is because Apple is planning something much bigger, a bigger spatial computing unit, and that's a self-driving vehicle. And I think the reason why they're preparing us for this idea that spatial computers are something we can comfortably wear on our bodies is because otherwise people are going to freak out mm -hmm. if they sit into a vehicle that is being dreamed by, by a computer. However, if it's the second spatial computer or the third, people might be more willing to accept this meme, this idea, this, vir this viral idea that Apple is putting in place. And, you know, they've been working on the spatial computing stuff for seven, eight years now. So now that it's finally out, I feel like we're going to see a whole new set of copy and in general ideas injected into the mainstream specifically by Apple as a company. But then obviously as the industry tries to kind of keep up with it, because, you know, Apple's like, um, they're not a first mover. Mm -hmm. Like they are, they come in when they're ready. You know, you saw that Sony was also kind of scrambling to put in uh, a little bit of that uh, to to ride the mimetic wave of spatial computing because they came out with their headset uh, recently, a few days ago as well. Yeah, and I'm sure we're gonna see a sleuth of uh, devices this this and next year, basically. I think your point about Apple is interesting because, um, and I remember writing a piece for Forbes probably about 10 years ago now, um, where they made a key hire um, from, uh, a, now who was it? It might have come from Magic Leap, I can't remember, but certainly someone with a uh, background in extended or mixed reality. And the one thing that I really noticed about the original Vision Pro keynote was that it was about an ecosystem. So whereas a lot of these devices are or a lot of these manufacturers are bringing out devices that feel very standalone and you have to integrate it with whatever you have already. Apple was already thinking about, well, you've got your Vision Pro, we've got the phone, we've got your watch. How do they all work together? You know, you've got HomePod as well. How does that work with the Vision Pro? And I think having not only an app ecosystem and obviously the Mac, MacBooks and the Mac range, but also the device range as well, that starts to share the same operating system. Because I can see, like you say, you know, even with a car, uh, the self-driving car, or um, I can see them all having the same operating system eventually, which means that everything becomes seamless and interoperable. Well, that's a big, that's a big thing that Apple does right, which is they integrate you into a system that's fully closed. And unlike, you know, I've, I'm a big fan of PCs and Android, but I've been using a Mac for the last couple of years begrudgingly at first absolutely <laughs> but now i'm like you know connectivity i can just put my uh, airpods in and it will immediately switch from my phone to my computer and back and like these are these small things that like once mm. you kind of taste them it's hard to go back um and and i can feel like the tendrils of the memetic machine that apple has been uh, installing in my mind is like taking hold more and more um, and from a, from kind of like a, a, a humanity's point of view, where we look at the ideas that are spreading throughout the world and how, you know, they influence the way humans think and in general, like how we, um, interact with technology, like there, it's a very sound system. They, they really nailed the whole part of, uh, adoption of technology really well. And, and even if you, if you look at the keynote from uh wwdc last year you will see that uh tim cook says this is our first spatial mm. computer right so everything is pre-engineered like every single word like if you i don't want to go into like you know they they planned everything out 10 years in advance but like they certainly seem to have a hold of how to communicate well and that's always impressive to see um apple's a cool company mm. they yeah. are you do also do a lot of cool things in terms of how you approach technology, which is all about anthropology, you know, and um, and how, uh, well, essentially psychology, anthropology, and how humans really interact with tech. So when you, you, when you and I first met, um, you talked a lot about intersubjectivity. And, you know, can you yeah. give, give us a bit, a, a bit more context around what that means and then obviously how that applies to 
to, you know, to the future of technology and obviously spatial computing as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. So yeah, I, I, I have a humanities and so, social sciences background. So my major in the university is sociology, art history, and then I did a PhD in anthropology, which I never finished. Um, but the thing that kind of really always interested uh, me was like, how do human groups interact? And what it is, what is it about culture that creates a point of view for us to to view through uh, like everything we do we, we view through a lens and you know like even today you mentioned something i i checked your uh, linkedin and you were talking about how people always you know end up uh, uh, remind me exactly what you said so you said oh yeah um uh, uh, for context there was a quote from david ogilby um mm -hmm. uh, from the uh, from the agency um, and it was all around surveys and people People don't do what they say, don't think what they do, and don't. And uh, it was uh, I can let me let yeah. me see if I can dig out the exact quote. But um, yeah, but but they, it, it goes back to you know people who are surveyed when they have something in front of them and they are asked a question, they will say what they think the respond or the the, the responder wants to hear or the respondee wants to hear or whatever it is the the question giver. Um, but they they act in a completely different way. Yeah. In psychology, this is called theory of mind. Mm -hmm. And theory of mind states that what we do is we respond to other people in the ways that they expect us to respond to them, right? It's not only humans who do this. Crows do this as well. Apes mm -hmm. do this as well. Like in uh, observing uh, animal behavior, we can kind of extend the theory of mind to more than just human behavior, which I find fascinating. But to get back to the point of intersubjectivity. So what is intersubjectivity and why is it important? Well, intersubjectivity is this idea that what we do is we want our version of reality to be confirmed by other people around us. So if uh, you and I share a joke, an internal joke from the split uh, 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 conference, fiaca, the concept mm -hmm. of fiaca, right? And you're going to be like, oh, yeah, you know, taking things easy. But like all of our listeners and watchers are not going to know what that means. So we need to provide context for them. So basically, fiaka is this concept from Croatian culture that you need to take things slowly, you know, chill. And uh, this is what our split hosts were constantly talking about <laughs> and kind of making us, you know, not talk about work and kind of relax. And here's the thing, right? Like now you, you, you just laugh. Right? You laugh because you know exactly what I'm talking about. But most of the people listening to this, they don't know this. They don't feel it the way we did because they lack intersubjectivity with the experiences that you and I had. Now, like, why would this be important for us when we're trying to think about technology and designing experiences? It's because it's a human, a basic human need to feel accepted by your environment. And we constantly drop in and out of intersubjectivity. So for instance, when we are um, talking to our friends and they, they, they have a reference that we know, and then somebody else is sitting there and they don't know the reference, you know, like if we share an internal joke, if we go to a party and everybody knows the song and starts dancing and we're like, okay, like, like, uh, why is, why is everybody so into this song? Like, Constantly, we have situations in which we crave to feel connected and to have other people kind of validate our version of reality. You know, the other side of that is psychosis, mm. uh, being completely uh, divorced from what's going on around you and literally hallucinating what's going on. So um, this was something that was uh, crucial for the project that I was working with before, Aoki Labs and, and Matalus, which are creating a shared augmented reality experience uh, where all the participants can see the same thing in the same place. And um, probably most of your listeners know, uh, knowing you and knowing that you're a technical person, that the big, big bottleneck right now for any kind of shared experience is the ability to share things mm. and make them have the same coordinates on multiple devices so that the devices can communicate about a position of a digital object in material physical space, right? 
So basically machines don't have proprioception. They don't have proprioception is the sense of knowing where the parts of your body are. So if I close my eyes and I try to touch my nose, I know how to do it because I know where my finger is uh, in a um, relationship with my nose. Um, machines don't have that. It's not currently necessary, but in the future of connected devices, where we're going to have a spatial computing component on mm -hmm. top of the computing that exists right now, it's going to become extremely important for devices to kind of be aware of themselves and also of manipulate uh, uh, digital objects that can be manipulated. So uh, immaterial things, digital cons constructs in physical spaces, because that's what spatial computing is going to allow. Like the mixed reality side of it is us being in the same room physically and having digital content displayed in that room and also being able to interact with it. So currently we can't really interact with it because most of the web AR that's happening happens because basically everybody downloads an asset and then have the, has it uh, projected into a space around them. But if we really want people to have interactive experiences, to have intersubjectivity, we're going to have to figure out how to have them interact with the same thing. Right. Do, do you think that's as equally important for spatial computing as it is for, for things like AI and robotics then? Because you mentioned, obviously, robots or, or certainly machines have no concept or <clears throat> of themselves as well yeah. as the space around them. Um, and certainly our experiences with AI seem to be quite singular. Yes, we can share an experience in terms of, oh, look what I've wrote using ChatGPT or with MidJourney, but there isn't that collective experience going on. Well, here's the thing, right? Like, I'm a big believer in spatial computing and, and mixed reality. See, see what Apple is doing to me? Because they wanted to say mixed reality, and I already <laughs> kind of like self-corrected. So, like, I'm a big believer in mixed reality experiences because... Um, like you and I are now talking through a computer, but we are trying to simulate the idea of being in the same room together. Hmm. That's the quintessential human experience. People don't want virtual worlds. That's what I think. I think people want to hang out with their friends, with their loved ones, with people in their physical surrounding, go to a park, go to a cafe, go to a movie, a cinema, and experience something together. If we allow them to do that with digital objects, which are going to be in space, it might feel more natural. And within mm. 15, 20 years, kids are going to be saying, oh, you know, like you guys were like chatting online. Okay, like that's fine, but like that's not what we really want to do, you know? So I believe the AR, VR, XR component of technology is the eyes and ears of AI. So this is a quote that I heard from, uh, um, I can't remember exactly, it's somebody from, from Microsoft, but like the idea that AI is going to extend through mixed reality into mm -hmm. physical space. And here's how I see this happening. Like we all become wizards. We like conjure stuff up in the palm of our hand when we're explaining something. So imagine if you could have a voice activated AI assistant that can create an image in 3D in the space you're sharing with your friends while you're explaining something to them. So the same way you would maybe show them, you know, that thing we all do. It's like, okay, wait, 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 let me show you that YouTube video. Okay. Now, so you take out your phone, like you turn it towards your friends mm. and then you're like showing them, right? Like that's currently the way we share stuff. But like, imagine when we can actually just conjure things up through the precise language that we use. Currently, it's language. Currently, we need to still prompt and create kind of very specific um, statements, which is already kind of going more towards the natural language processing, uh, which we are kind of seeing. <clears throat> and I think prompt engineering is going to be obsolete in two years' time. Like, I don't mm -hmm. think that's going to be a thing anymore. <clears throat> But there's going to be something else instead, and that is going to be the ability to precisely communicate about the things that you 
imagine in your mind. And this precise communication, this linguistic communication, is going to be the thing that really separates the experts in something from enthusiasts. Hey. And for that, AI will be very useful. Because it's going to kind of, like the way that I see AI, AI going in the future is we have smaller data sets, which are trained on a specific amount of information, which people start using to create their own styles of visual, uh, well, let's call it visual communication at this point. The same way an artist, a painter, um, works and adapts the paint or the sculpture to a specific style that you can, after 20, 10, 20, 15, 20 years of them, recognize, you can immediately recognize a Van, a Van Gogh, hey. right? Like, I feel the same thing is going to be applied to data sets for AI, which we can then express visually in space. So, um, and of course, it's going to be a feedback loop because the things we create are going to be used for training models further. So, yeah, I think we're going to be, yeah, I, I, it's, it's akin to me like D&D spellcasting. Like, we will be able to kind of manifest our imagination physically in space that, and other people interacting with it. That's, the, far... that's the best case scenario. I, I think it's a great scenario. I think we're a bit far, far <laughs> away from that being pervasive and uh, throughout um, society at the moment, just because of the device form factor kind of hinders, hinders that a lot. And a lot of it rests on, you know, connectivity, battery life, how small it can get and how comfortable mm -hmm. it can be. But yeah, I mean, it, it's funny, actually. It reminds me of the uh, techno mages in Babylon 5, where the guy was doing incantations in midair and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, I can see I can see us all running around with shaved heads and black robes. Technomancy, <laughs> dude. Yeah, Technomancy yeah. is what's happening. Yeah. yeah. So so you were born in um, in the 80s. And, yeah. and, and I originally dug up a, a piece about... Um, a piece of retrofuturism about um, back in the 60s. But I decided to look actually more in line with when you were born and to see what was happening. And I actually managed to find um, there was a robot butler um, in a Chinese restaurant in Pasadena. Um, and let me just find the... Um... Yeah, so a Chinese fast food restaurant in Pasadena in California had two robot servants called Tanbo R1 <coughs> and Tanbo R2. Uh, four and a half feet tall, 180 pounds each. Um, and they would scoot around bringing trays of chow mein, spare ribs and fortune cookies to tables. Now, it's funny how we, let me think, now what were they? $20,000 each um, back in 1980s. And I think it's, it's, it's and, and they used to blast out disco music as well at the same time. And if you remember, you might, might, might be before your time, but Metal Mickey or the, um, uh, the kind of sort of a, a small squatter robot version of Robbie the Robot from um, Forbidden Planet. They looked mm -hmm. a bit like that and they were kind of moving around. And I kind of find that really fascinating that we are moving towards general purpose robotics and AI now with a lot of the you know you've got tesla's optimus you have um humans r1 or, or x1 i think which is something a uh a, a startup that sam altman is also invested mm -hmm. in and um, there's a few of them kicking around now um and it's funny how we're we're starting to move back in this direction even though 20 30 40 years ago we were experimenting with with robotics mm -hmm. back then how do you think how do you think we're going to respond to that as a society having these devices um moving around with us well you know i kind of uh, robotics is a very clear manifestation of science fiction it feels mm. you know it's one of those things it's like a staple of, of of science fiction and you know when most people talk about ai this has changed now, but I believe people of our generation who are in their 30s and 40s, when you say AI, people think Skynet, right? Yeah. Terminator, right? They think um, giant, like 
powerful metallic skeletons with red piercing light in their eyes, kind of like moving about. Um, and then, you know, you see the Boston Dynamics um, uh, type of robot, which is kind of like a cute dog or could be a cute dog. And unless it's got like the head attached, then it kind of yeah. looks freaky as hell. Um, like the head hand uh, yeah. appendage, right? Um, uh, I, I think that it's uh, robots are like, I think they're always going to be, I think robots are always going to be cool. I don't know. Like, I think it's a cool concept that you have this thing that you build and it moves around. And in fact, um, I am an investor in, in a, in a startup from Croatia, which is called circuit mess, which recently, uh, made a deal with Walmart in the U S and what they do is they create STEM toys for kids so that kids can learn things like robotics, uh, no code coding, uh, logic, programming logic, um, AI assistance, like all these kinds of things through a subscription based model where they just get a toy every month or every three months that they need to put together themselves and they learn how to solder. They learn how to do all these like practical mechanical things. Cause I think ultimately, like, I think most people want to build something. They want to have yeah. an actual thing that they built. And like, I think a robot is the ultimate fantasy of doing that something that's so good that it actually makes your life better you know because you don't want to build an oven right <laughs> you want to build a robot so i think robots are always going to be something that's quite quite interesting to us and i think um the more humanoid they look the more we are going to project on them we're going to anthropomorphize them we're going to mm. make them we're going to we're going to make ourselves feel things towards them because um, they seem more alive. So an AI without a body is like an um, apparition, right? It, it, it doesn't feel real. But the moment you put it in the body, it feels real. And then if you see somebody kicking that body and the robot falling over, it immediately creates an empathetic response yeah. in you. So I think uh, we, we will forever be linked with the idea of creating a humanoid version of us, which is artificial. So I don't know if that things... answers the question. <laughs> I hope well, it does. Actually, it adds, it, adds a, a, it adds an interesting nuance, which is an, an interesting question, which is, you know, do we want to build robots that look like us or certainly have humanoid features? Or do we want to keep robotics in in a in a realm where it doesn't look like us and they're built for the specific purpose? So again, you know the nineteen, the, you know the eighty three Chinese robot was just literally like a, a a garbage can with a dome on top and uh -huh. a couple of arms to to basically hold trays. Now, would we ex would we accept that more readily because it is, you know, or you know, because it doesn't look like us, or do we want that robot servant to look like, you know, a small humanoid instead? You know, what, you know, is, is there in your feel, you know, in your, I guess in your sense, which is more readily acceptable, you know, to the wider population outside of, you know, our, our bubble, I guess. Well, I want to ask you, right? Like, what do you think? Well, it's funny when you talk about anthropomorphizing, because, you know, one of the earlier, um, uh, uh, science fiction movies that I remember was Silent Running and they didn't look like you know you had like Huey, that, Dewey right. and Louie and you, they didn't look humanoid at all um, and yet when something happened to them you absolutely felt anguish you know one of them was hurt one of them got blown away in space and things like that so I think it's it might actually be down to an individual preference where you know, you can still anthropomorphize and have feelings and project towards something, but it depends on, I mean, we do it with pets. They don't yeah. look like humans. I mean, I, I talk to my cat. Yeah. I've got three cats. I talk to them. I, I imagine what they're thinking in their head. They respond to me, et cetera. Um, and, or not you know, respond I, to you. Or not, that yeah, cats. Well, yeah, cats, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but I think, I think I would prefer a, a non-humanoid um, form factor over a, a humanoid because I think for me, if I look at a humanoid um, robot, I would think, yeah, that's a robot I, I, and, and it's Is not it? human Is even it? though it looks like human whereas mm -hmm. I think for the other side, because it's almost it almost feels like a pet or whatever it's helpless, it, it might it, to me, I'm projecting 
uh, a, a sense of dependency. That thing depends on me giving its answer, you know, giving it responses and, and, and it? commands and things. So therefore, I've got to treat it right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a weird sense in my head. I think I would prefer non-humanoid uh, forms than than humanoid. So there are two movies that I want to reference, right? One mm. of them is okay. So there is uh, Apple is uh, <laughs> augmenting me with balloons. Balloons, that was interesting. Yeah, there's also hearts, I think. And okay, yeah, all right, yeah, there we go. <laughs> yeah, spatial computing and right? intersubjectivity. Exactly. Um, yeah. So for all of our listeners, I'm using the feature which allows me to like trigger emoticons with like hand gestures, <laughs> which is kind of like pre spatial computing. Cast, uh, spell casting. Um, so there are two movies that I, I would like to reference. One of them is Flight of the Navigator, mm -hmm. where you have the ship. And boy, did I think that was like the best thing ever when I was a kid. You have a ship that responds to you and like talks to you like a friend. And the other one is going to be Blade Runner. And mm -hmm. uh, originally I saw Blade Runner when I was around like eight or nine years old. So I was born in 83 and Blade Runner came out in 82 and it was a very strange evening for me because I, at the time I was like eight or nine and there was a double feature thing on Creation TV. So every second Wednesday they had like a double feature sci-fi. So on the, on the same night they saw Blade Runner and Alien at like eight. Oh. <laughs> so, so I remember, I remember seeing Blade Runner for the first time. And specifically, I remember the scene of the flying car flying through the city and mm. seeing that mega commercial for Coca-Cola with the geisha, with the Japanese uh, trust person and just like speaking in Japanese. And I remember thinking like, I have no, like I, I kind of had to say that this is the Japanese language, but I felt like. This is so foreign to me, it could, it might as well be Martian language. And there was this, this sense of like the world being massive in that moment. And there are so many things that I don't know anything about. Um, but the idea of replicants of mm. androids was really, really simple and easy for me to accept because they looked like humans. Now the ethical concerns of the, the replicant only having a four year lifespan and wanting to live longer. Spoiler, if you haven't seen Blade Runner, then I don't know why you're listening to this show. But like, <laughs> basically, if, you know, like uh, the replicants wanted to live, right? And that felt very normal to me. The mm. idea of a flying flying car was way more abnormal to me. Even like a different culture was way more abnormal to me than a robot that looks like a human being. So I guess what I'm trying to get, get at here is that like, I feel technology, like the more naturally it kind of intertwines with our daily lives and habits, the less we think about it as being magical, where, you know, you and me being connected through an invisible array uh, of, of power that's generated by water running and us being able to talk right now is in fact, like completely insane, right? Like there's mm -hmm. no other animal that is able to so easily integrate things into how they live so quickly as humans do. So that that kind of invisible, the word technology just blends into the background and, and it just, you don't have to think about it. And it's really interesting when you talk about Blade Runner and Alien at the same time, mm. because they had two different futures, but they were still, you know, very different futures, I guess. Although they still had... Um, androids when you think about it because you had ash who was actually turns out to be a bit of a dick um but you also had the replicants as well and you know ash had ash was very followed orders yeah whereas he was, he roy was batty, writing his script yeah yeah whereas yeah. roy batty was and, and his replicants were were wanting to essentially live like you say had thought for themselves and evo had evolved beyond their programming mm -hmm. they both actually brought together um a sense of a very practical future as well, because if you look at things like Star Trek, you know everything's touch screen, everything looks fantastic and very futuristic. Whereas these two movies are very dirty and grimy, and everything is very tactile, and everything still has buttons. You know, as a, as a kid growing up, you've you obviously you have your 
Androids or replicants, you have your giant augmented um, screens and Coca-Cola and Atari kind of sort of billboards and things like that. And then you have your Star Trek future, which is very futuristic. Which one inspired you more then, do you think? I think Star Trek was my gateway into sociology. Right. Like thinking about actual ethics. Um, who deserves to live, die? How do you give merit to a culture? You know, the first, the first, the prime directive in, in Star Trek mm. is like, don't get involved into other cultures, right? It's like, it seems like such a scientific thing to do. Um, when it comes to alien, I mean, dude, they just gave me nightmares in the very beginning. <laughs> Like there were two movies that I was really like I had nightmares from. It was Ghostbusters two, oh right, and the the Vigo guy like the slime river like under New York like that was horrendous. I was checking my bed for like slime for months, and the other one was Alien. But um, I recently rewatched it, and it's such a great thriller movie. Hmm. Uh, I think that uh, the whole idea of like corporations. Like the Wayland Yutani Corporation, which is like sacrificing humans to go and like find this xenomorph on another planet. I think that kind of um, influenced when I was very young this idea that the future will be basically run by companies, you know, which we're kind of seeing happen like at this point. You know, if we have like mm -hmm. the private sector like mining asteroids, like how are you going to beat that? Like which government is going to be able to? Like be that, and and we see it now in uh, for all mankind, right? Like this is actually one of the themes in the newest season of for all mankind, like mining an asteroid and like bringing it into the orbit of Mars or or Earth. Hmm. Uh, and then when it comes to a movie like Blade Runner, I think it really kind of influenced me uh, about thinking how the world is weaved together from very different things. Yeah, so so those would be my my sci-fi influences. I'm, I also love Star Wars as well, which is basically you know space wizards. Mm -hmm. um, so like that kind of goes into my love towards D and D and fantasy. So um, I would say that probably science fiction and fantasy are are two of the most fruitful influences that I've had, and and things that made me happy since I was very very young, and kind of realizing today people use sci-fi to generate ideas, usually in a context that the author himself was probably criticizing. Um, like that's a very interesting time to live in where like a person's like, look, okay, so I'm gonna make this like cautionary tale about using this tech. And then somebody 20 years from there, it's like, we gotta build that. We won't, the torment we won't have nexus. It. Yeah, yeah, we won't, <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, so, so it's an interesting time to kind of think about, uh, technology because things really are like, it seems like things are really speeding up. Like, I think we need a multidisciplinary approach for, uh, learning about humanities and classics and, and, and mm. being a bit more aware. And I think here's where we, like you and I butt heads a little bit online because you're like, why do we need to do this? Like, this is like, I feel like your voice is a bit sometimes, you know, like, cynical mm -hmm. um and like i think it's totally normal like i think technology is totally agnostic right like we need to really think about how we want to use it and like that comes from like thinking about what makes us human and it takes us back to art and creativity and creating things for their own sake because they bring us a sense of enjoyment and kind of not being beholden to this whole idea of productivity and mm. like things needing to be like incredibly incredibly useful like we don't know like we have no idea how useful they're gonna be like social media is a, like a massive like a global experiment in human behavior like we have no idea how that's gonna end up still right and it's run by companies so like technology needs, I feel like technology in general needs like more, more anthropologists, more sociologists, more psychologists who kind of just look and think about like, how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and science fiction is this cross section of those two things. 
it's kind of like sociology of the future in a way. Well, I think they should teach science fiction a lot more in, uh, at an earlier age. I think we have lost a bit of that kind of uh, imagination and the ability to think beyond what we already know. So, I mean, back in the, you know, in the early days of science fiction, they were dreaming up things that we had no concept of. Um, you know, Mary Shelley, you know, like you say, they were actually exploring very human issues and ethics and ideas and the philosophies around some of the things that they were imagining. Mm -hmm. um, and they wrapped that up in, in, a, in a story or, or in a particular narrative. But the ideas themselves were so far ahead of time. Whereas now what I've found, and this is just a personal observation, is that a lot of science fiction seems to be grounded in what we already know now. Because it always, it always say, oh yeah, we have um, sentient flying spaceships and things. And it's like, well, that's kind of where we would head anyway. We've got mm -hmm. sentient cars, if you want to look at it that way, which know how to drive you from A to B. So extrapolating to have a spaceship that flies around and knows where it wants to go is, is, not, a, is not a leap of imagination at all. And I think we've kind of hit a barrier where it's like, well, we can't think of anything new because... Mm -hmm. We're actually being clouded by everything that we've we already know already, like AI and holograms and 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 so forth. So, I do, I do actually believe, and I said this in a in a in a TED talk that I gave back in 2017 that AI might actually free us to enjoy the humanities a lot more, um, and actually push them forward um, to the front of education and and wanting to to understand the world around us as technology takes care of the more mundane things that we shouldn't really be wasting our time on. Technology is just the history of us being lazy. Yeah. Like, you know, let's, let's move this thing from here to here without using our backs. Right. Uh, to the point that it's like, let's automate like bulk replies to emails. Right. Like it's, is the same, like, you know, nothing about humanity has changed in the impulse of us trying to live a more lazy life, which is totally fine. Like, this is not me kind of uh, uh, ranting on on the ethics of it. Like, absolutely, right? Like, you want to be free to experience life to, to, to its fullest, whatever the hell that means, right? Especially mm -hmm. today, because you have so many modes of, like, living that you can choose from. Mm -hmm. But, like... So this morning, I've been really thinking about something. So a very good friend of mine's dad passed away on Monday. Sorry and to he, hear. Yeah, th thank you. Um, and my heart goes out to him, right? And then I was thinking, okay, so this, this guy's dad had cancer. And like he was in the hospital and he was hooked up to machines and he was getting chemotherapy. So he was being treated in the most advanced possible way that a human in the 21st century can be treated better than a king a hundred years ago. That's for sure. Like no yeah. kid could, no king, no money could afford this, right? However, he passed away. When a person passes away, what do we turn to? Like we turn to art, religion, thinking about how we deal with the loss. And that's a uniquely human trait. That never will change, no matter what kind of technology we have at our beck and call. So I think in in the moments when you know engineering and medicine and and uh, computer science can help us uh, deal with life, like in a moment where all those things fail, or all all we are left with, or everything that we have access to as humans is this other part, which is literature art, mm -hmm. music, things that will help us get through the tough times. And I think those things are just going to be augmented by technology as time goes by. Us writing emails, typing emails, saying emails out loud. Like, who gives a shit, honestly? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's busy work that I think should be eradicated now and and if 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 technology can allow us to, you know it's it's a bit of a strange thought when you when you consider that technology can allow us to be more human towards one another and ourselves then um that's the the kind of future 
that we should be aiming for with technology, not using technology to make us more productive at things that we have no add no value or or have no meaning for our for an individual life. Um, Damir, this has been an absolutely fantastic mm-hmm. conversation, and I wish we could spend more and more time on it. Um, and and I'm going to have to drag you on for another for another show for sure, just to keep this one going. I would I would um, love to be uh, on another show. Yeah, uh, where can people find out more about you? Well, currently, you can find me on LinkedIn, um, Damir first. Um, that's that's where I spend most of my time. I'm also technically on Twitter, but I don't really um, tweet that much. You can find me at Damir's Fist at Twitter. Um, and yeah, like I'll keep you po- posted about uh, the cool things that I'm doing. We didn't really get into D and D as much, but uh, there's some fun stuff that I'm working on, which might, uh, which a lot of people might find interesting. So maybe next time we go into uh, on a fantasy rent instead. I think that would be great, actually. Yeah, we'll spend a lot more time on that side. Um, for anyone listening or watching, I'll put uh, Demir's, um uh, details in the show notes, so you can actually find all the links uh, in one place. Um, again, Demir, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Uh, please join me again at the next episode of Days of Future Past, where we will have another guest talking about what inspired them as kids, uh, what the future might look like, and what the future was p- supposed to look like. Um, until next time. This is Days of Futures Past, signing off, when we'll once again peel back the curtain on more lost futures. Stay tuned, and remember, the future may be here, but the past never fades. Until next time. Days of Futures Past was brought to you by Theo Priestley, keynote speaker, author, and retrofuturist. If you'd like to appear as a guest and reminisce about futures gone by, get in touch. I've been your radio host, Andrew Helbig. Goodbye for now.